September 26, 2023, round 18 of the eNASCAR Coca-Cola series. The championship four drivers have all flown out to Charlotte, North Carolina to race live in front of friends, family, and several NASCAR personalities. Coming to the white flag, Stuart Haas Racing Esports driver Steven Wilson has the championship well in hand as his family celebrates. Another point of focus throughout the broadcast is that this will be the last race of junior motorsports driver Michael Conti's illustrious championship career. And while this story is about a champion, and about a junior motorsports driver, we'll have to fall to the back of the pack to find him. Driving the Dale Earnhardt Jr. number 88 in a car that many in the field don't even know how he got in in the first place. But that is because they don't know about the legend or the career of Kevin King. A sim racing career that is older than multiple drivers in the field. A career that is older than iRacing itself. This is the story of one of sim racing's first and most forgotten champions, and what could be, 20 years later, his final ride. In the fall of 1994, Papyrus Design Group released NASCAR Racing, a revolutionary sim racing game which was considered by many to be the absolute pinnacle of racing simulators and racing games. And it was also this game that sparked the interest of a college kid named Kevin King. Yeah, so my name is Kevin King. I've been racing, oh man, since, if you want to call it, NASCAR 1. I did... Uh, phone to phone with my friend back in the day. So I just ran Atlanta, all Atlanta, you know, it was 20 laps, that's be all you gave you. 20 lap races every single time. And that's what I did for like a year until I was like, you know what, I think I like doing this. Let me try to get more into this. And that's when NASCAR 2 came out, 3 and all that fun stuff. Subsequent releases in the following years led to better and better games until Papyrus's magnum opus, NASCAR Racing Season 2003, a game that is still being played today due to its modability and its online capabilities. It was in this game where NASCAR Racing Simulator's competitive scene began to grow, as no longer did people have to fly across the country to race on land setups for single races. Though you could choose whichever username you wanted to join an online lobby, most serious and competitive drivers chose to use their real names just like they would in real life. So we would just kind of follow each other server to server and we would just talk. You know, you couldn't have voice chat, but you would just type a lot. And we just kind of got to know each other, who was who, and understood, okay, that's, that's Chris Sherburn, look at his name. And so we would just talk to each other and whatever voice chat at the time was available, we'd say, hey, come on over here and give people some information. We had to do everything by email back then, cause you know, or ICQ or whatever it was back then. Because of this, people began to earn their reputation in the community with the most prolific driver of them all being Dale Earnhardt Jr. himself. Um, you just treated him like anyone else. And if you didn't treat him like anyone else, he was not happy with you um, because he didn't like that. He wanted to be race hard, race fair, um, don't move over for him. Um, but the crazy stuff about him is he had speed. So it wasn't like you were just riding behind him and having fun, like he had legit speed. And I think with that, he kind of created, you know, some bonds with some people like knowing that, hey, they're not treating me like I'm some superstar. They're treating me like a sim racer. That's what we're doing. Let's have some fun. And um, throughout that, he created, you know, a lot of good friendships. And I think he appreciated the way we just, you know, we would wreck him just like anyone else. That was the best part about it. But heading into 2004, a prominent group of people decided they wanted more than just online single races. And though there were a few leagues scattered about even back then, there wasn't a pinnacle league. And it was Dale Earnhardt Jr. who started the DMP Online Racing League, recruiting some of his friends to help run and even broadcast the league, which was a feat back in 2004. So DMP was a group that um, a few of us, obviously led by Dale Jr., created a online league at the time. We were doing a lot of pickup racing. But at some point, it was like, you know, we, we have so many people we race with. Why don't we just create like a league where we all can just have our structure? And one of the drivers who was recruited to compete right away in their top pro series was, of course, Kevin King. He had already become good friends with many drivers in that league through text chat and online lobbies and the voice chat systems that were around back then. So it made sense that Kevin would get one of the coveted invites to the invite-only DMP league. A lot of the guys at the time was just the top 
top echelon of racing um they were in the league so it was very competitive but very fun as well you know denny hamlin showed up martin truex tj this was also around the time when players found out that they could alter the ini files in the game to change the characteristics of the track one track modifier named brian ring was known to make versions of tracks that had more than one groove viable this league also raced in the truck instead of the cup car because this was the most newly released and fully fleshed out vehicle from Project Wildfire. With Project Wildfire being a offshoot of the now defunct Papyrus Design Group who wanted to finish the DLC that had been planned for the game. So when you put that all together, you have the best car on the best tracks and a league headed by Dale Earnhardt Jr. who only invite the best drivers. This was a very early and primitive version of professional sim racing. In early 2004, names like Dale Earnhardt Jr., Denny Hamlin, Martin Truex Jr., Donnie Leah, and TJ Majors all suited up for the race. And while there was no prize money or anything on the line besides pride, the racing was as intense as it could have possibly been and coming away with the very first win of the DMP Online Racing League at Daytona was Kevin King. That was it. That was like everything that I've done throughout the years that I've been racing, like it came to that moment, that season to where like I finally put it out there and I beat at the time who were the best of the best. And like that was my accomplishment. In the inaugural season in 2004, Kevin King would rack up an additional four wins for a total of five, but falling just short of the championship to his rival and buddy, Chris Shearburn. Racing was super tight. We used the trucks back then because we felt like that was the best handling, the closest racing. So you had a lot of close racing as a whole. You didn't really get too spread out. So you had to understand how to race correctly. It wasn't by any means, I think the stats show that I did pretty well, but I, it wasn't like, oh, you just went in there and won every race, like no big deal. It was it was not easy. Like you had someone two tenths off your bumper for an entire run, and if you messed up, they're the inside of you. So it was, it was very difficult, but very fun. While Chris only won three races in that first season, he was more consistent with 14 top fives and top tens compared to Kevin King's 10 and in third place in the standings hot on their heels was a young up-and-comer hotshot named Denny Hamlin. So it's funny, Denny and I had a, a love-hate relationship back then. He's the guy that ran the black truck, and back then we, we thought of him as, oh, he's just this punk that's coming up, because it's Denny, right? Denny from now does, had not changed from Denny back then, so I can appreciate that. He's the same person. Uh, but back then, we're all the same age, so it's kind of like, hey, like, what? Like, you're talking to me this way? We just go back and forth. But he ran a black truck, because that's what he ran, I believe, in his late model stuff back then. And he would go out there, and he was one of the best. And you wouldn't think it, because, like, a oh, real racer, but he was... He was legit, and um, to beat him was pretty hard because he was super, super fast and super aggressive, and he didn't give any any room. And that was awesome. I told you it was gonna be a tough one, but we pulled it out. Thanks for the ride, NASCAR Nation. It was in an interview one time. I helped him at Pocono, and it helped him get his first one is what he told me, so we'll see. I don't know about that, but um, we ran Pocono quite a bit before his, his debut, and I think it's turned out a little bit. I don't know. I'll have a little bit of percentage from that success, I guess. Heading into late 2004 and early 2005, Chris Shearburn took a step back from the DMP Online Racing League, leaving it to be Kevin King's to lose. And from the first race on in season two, Kevin King took his grasp on the league and never let go, winning the first three races at Atlanta, Richmond, and Gateway. Denny Hamlin would put his name in the books, winning the fourth race at Darlington, but then Kevin King went on another three race winning streak at Vegas, Kansas, and Infineon, or as we know today, Sonoma. Kevin King would go on to win in dominant fashion season two of the DMP Racing Pro Series, with Kevin King and Denny Hamlin combining to win 11 out of the 12 races. It was amazing because I think at the time we were probably, let's see, I was 23 at the time. So I think most people think that's probably your prime as far as talent's concerned, I guess. But um, to race against, again, Shearburn, Sheehan, Gorlinski, Chris Main, Bob Bryant, Junior, Hamlin, Truex, 
like the list is pretty nuts of who we had to race against. So t for me to actually compete and do well, I was super proud because it was like, okay, it's our first year of all these super fast guys. I was able to kind of do it. At the time, I was pretty quick. Over the following seasons, Kevin King would go on to cement himself as the greatest of all time in the DMP Pro Series, where in season three, while only finishing third in the standings, he had a league leading eight wins and 17 top fives and 22 starts. In season four, he would take back his title with another dominant season with five wins. Season five was no different with another championship season along with a league leading five wins and 11 top fives and 14 starts. Season six, he would fall just short of another championship 22 points behind Bob Bryant, but Kevin still had a league leading four wins. But for Kevin King, this was just the beginning. Outside of driving for DMP, Kevin became good friends with many of the drivers in the series, which led to some very interesting opportunities in the real world of NASCAR. I was doing a lot of like real car schemes. I would take a Kevin Harvick scheme, which I was kind of known for at the time in Dale Earnhardt stuff, that I would recreate whatever car was for that race. Like that was one big thing back then. We would try to make realistic cars. So um, I had a buddy who was a sim racer named Vince Moore. He worked for RCR at the time. And um, I showed him a prototype car for fun I did. It was like a Reese's Pieces car. I was like, hey, check this out. I put it on the 21 um paint scheme and whatnot i showed it to him he's like hey funny you mentioned this because he would send me stuff from rcr to be like hey this is a schemes come out go ahead and re replicate it he and he said hey funny enough we're trying to get a rhesus car but we don't like anything that we got going on is there a way you can make one so it kind of just fell in my lap i just happened to know someone and i was like well what about this and they're like we love it congratulations here's your car i thought it was very basic but at the time it made the most sense like i was like okay well We'll make it bright orange and actually it looks pretty good. And then you saw it on the track and you're like, wow, that looks really good. For me, I think it was awesome because it showed everyone else like, whoa, if he can do it, like definitely I can do it. Cause I definitely, I wasn't the best out there. Um, it really kind of opened up the, the, the door for a lot of people to get into that. And I think it was just really cool to have someone come from the sim racing world to see a real car on the track and win its first race. So it was pretty awesome. But then Junior allowed me to do his, it's a red, white, and blue car. He ran at the Pepsi 400. Um, that was my first Junior car. I'm not a designer by any means, but someone who's can kind of touch that and say, well, I did that and you can't take it away from me. And I can kind of just always own that aspect. I think it's a really special feeling. But back on the sim side of things, as season seven and season eight came along throughout 2007 and 2008 respectively, the league had grown into something much bigger than it had started. The broadcasts, though now seen in low quality, were at the time almost indistinguishable from their real life counterparts with their amazing presentation and technology with the knowledge gained since season one. And many of the names that you see on the scoreboard in these 2007 races would be the ones that would end up in the early iRacing Pro Series. But speaking of iRacing, come 2008, a new place for competitive oval racing was born. DMP ended up running up to Season 10, but by that point the vast majority of the drivers had transitioned over to iRacing as they had added the cup car and the truck in late 2008 and early 2009. But Kevin King did not immediately transition over to iRacing just as some of the up and comers in DMP had. It was tough, it was tough. So I got the invite 2008 um, and I didn't like it. I didn't like it, I felt like I didn't have any control of the car, it was all different to me, it, I just, I wasn't comfortable at all. So there was a time where I started it and I was like, oh, I don't like this. And I think after about a year, I got into it a little bit more and I felt comfortable and I felt like, okay, there's more people now so I can race against buddies of mine and we can have fun and figure it out together. It was also around this time where Kevin started to get even more opportunities in the NASCAR design world. It turned into a lot of JRM cars. So when Brad was racing, most of those cars are from stuff I did. Um, the, the GoDaddy car that him and Danica ran, they were kind of like inverse cars. Um, most of those cars from like when JRM became a little bit bigger were stuff that I did. And then we did some more cup stuff. I did a National Guard that he ran at Richmond. And of course, obviously the uh, the Hendrix stuff with the number and the original um, Mountain Dew National Guard cars. That's kind of how those are probably more well known than my other stuff. 
Fast forward to 2009 and iRacing had already quickly established a professional sim racing scene. As iRacing's Drivers World Championship Pro Series geared up to start in 2009, it ended up leaving the station without the DMP legend Kevin King. Yeah, so it was like super quick when it all happened. I was like, wait, what is this? Like, this seems cool. This is this is competitive. I like that. After becoming comfortable with iRacing again, he decided to try to make the Pro Series in 2011. Back in the early days of iRacing, you would qualify for the Pro Series by finishing top of the point standings in the Class A Open Series. This system is very different to today's where instead of a single series where every result counted, you could drive in many attempts and get the most points possible to try to qualify for this series. Um, and that's when I started to do more and more of the competitive side of things. And I think it started to get more mature. The cars came out. We had um, cup cars now. We had um, Bush Series cars and or I guess nationwide cars. And it was way more fun to actually be a part of. And then it just kind of transitioned where 2011, I actually got into the Pro Series at the time, which was the le level below. A Pro License versus a DWC License meant that he would only be able to race in races where a current DWC driver could not show up. Back then, if they didn't have a full field, you can qualify in and the top qualifier from Pro Series slash contender would make the race. He was essentially relegated to being a field filler but he was not content with just being a field filler. Just three years prior and in a different game, he was used to beating the doors off of all of these names he was racing against. And in his third ever DWC race at the season finale at Homestead, Kevin King, as a pro series driver, took the win, announcing to the field that he was back and they should be scared of him for 2012. This 2012 campaign proved to be his most successful one, as he racked up two wins and finished top three in the overall point standings. Should have won Phoenix, got wrecked under yellow, trying to start the race as a leader, so that was cool. But I won Dover and I won the finale at Homestead. It was basically myself and Ray Alfala and Conti. If you look at the stats, it's like, if I finish second, one of them finished third. If I finish fourth, one finished fifth. Like there was no gaining points on any of us at the time. Um, and I had to win the race at Homestead and I did it, but race still finished like six or something. So it didn't matter. But many people's takeaway from the 2012 season was that there was a new contender up at the top, ready to fight with names like Ray Alfala and Michael Conti. But as iRacing kept evolving, Kevin King started to see his results dip and getting one final win in 2014, Kevin King was out of the league by 2016. There's a number of years, right? I kind of faded away and I was like, I just want to do something else. I think it was stale to a lot of people at the time. I think just everyone just kind of got over, um, at least for me, it's just the same thing. It was a longer career than most could possibly dream of in sim racing, starting at the very beginning, being dominant through NASCAR racing 2003, and seeing iRacing all the way through 2016. He had met lifelong friends in sim racing that led him to opportunities that he could have never imagined. And it was at this time where he took a step back from professional sim racing and became mostly known by the newer generation in the community as the guy who would argue with the new kids coming up for driving too dirty. Yeah, I just, and some people don't like that, right? They don't like the brightness. They don't like the fact that you said something they didn't want to hear. So not to say that I'm always right, but um, I've never been one to kind of shy away from an argument, which gets me in trouble sometimes. But come 2020, with a little extra free time and a lot of more time indoors, Kevin King found one more spark in him. And then I think when we're all kind of stuck inside, there's nothing else to do. And that's why I started sim racing again. And I was like, okay, this is, this is fun. Right, let me, let me see what this is about. And I think it was just kind of just thrown into like, I wonder if I could do this again. I wonder if I still have the ability to go out there and be competitive and be consistent and get back in that series. But now Kevin would have to qualify for the now Coca-Cola series through the much harder and more rigorous process. All the structure of everything is quite a bit different. It wasn't necessarily about being the fastest. Now it's, it's a lot of it just surviving the races. Um, sometimes that's very hard. So it was good to kind of get through all of that and get in there and have some good runs and um, have some good finishes. In 2021, he would fall short of this goal but in 2022, he would make his way through round one, round two, 
and all the way through the NASCAR Contender Series to make it to the iRacing Coca-Cola eNASCAR Series. And once again, 20 years after his NR2003 debut, Kevin King found himself in the field with eNASCAR's top 40 drivers, driving for one of the most prestigious teams in the league and for his friend, Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Junior Motorsports. Once I told him that I was kind of in it again, he was like, oh, and he's like, okay, well, if you make it, like, you know what's, you know what's going to happen. I was like, oh, okay, that's, that, that's going to be, I told my wife, I'm like, that's like a full circle thing, right? You create the number, you have a friend for so long, you're in, now you're in a series where you can drive for them. It's not just slap a paint scheme on, slap the number on that you created. To me, I feel like that was probably the coolest aspect of the entire thing was just to be like, well, I made it the Coke series, but look who I'm driving for. Like, I'm... I'm driving cars that now I can create some of my own cars that I've done in the past. The drivers surrounding him on the grid were a new generation, completely different than anybody he had raced against in his prime. It was kind of a different experience than I think most people were probably in Coke for, right? I was in there because I wanted to, I did it, but I connected with a good friend of mine who I'm now driving the number that I created, which was which is pretty awesome. While the racing was quite a bit different than I was used to, um, definitely not used to getting raced for like 30th as much or even being in 30th. Um, it was it was rewarding feeling to know that at the time I could go back out there, compete. And I feel like even still, I'm not I'm still competitive and I could go into the top series and still like make it back in there. And even though he would only place 25th in the standings with zero top 10s, but nine top 20s, this time was different. It told my wife, like, no matter really how I do in the season, like, obviously I want to do better than what I did. Um, be competitive, I'd just be like, oh, I made the field, congratulations, you're like running 50th. Like, it's not fun. The fact that it was competitive kind of caps off. But if I stopped racing and that was it, I could say I've gone through everything, right? I created myself as a person in terms of like my, my, my competitiveness. I was able to compete at the highest level against the people in my era and I was successful with it. And then I was able to come back and compete with the people of this era was successful, but with with my buddy kind of like letting me drive his car, which is pretty awesome. He was no longer alone atop a mountain staring down at the rest of the competition. He was within a generation where nobody was even scared of him. And there is something beautiful about seeing a scene start from the smallest that it could possibly be and grow to the heights that it is now. And so as Kevin King rounded the final corner in a mere 28th place and crossed the finish line on his 2023 eNASCAR Coca-Cola Series season, that did not particularly matter to him. Because sometimes sim racing can change your life. And when that happens, you just need to take a victory lap. <laughs>